I'd like to introduce Dr. Tamara Abdelbaki to talk oh, about uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, Dr. Moore, Dr. Korean, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sylvia for her kind invitation. And I have a, a talk today, a little metabolic, um, which is about the outcomes of bariatric surgery in the setting of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Also known as pseudotumor cerebri uh, and benign intracranial hypertension, which is a chronic uh, condition that is characterized by chronically elevated intracranial pressure without a detectable cause. In order to reach a diagnosis, we need to um, uh, apply the modified DANDY criteria, which includes signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, no neurological localizing signs, uh, elevated CSF, and normal neuroimaging studies. It predominantly affects obese women in the childbearing uh, age, and one study found that 92% of women and 94% were obese. Mm. And the study went ahead and concluded, if you're a woman with a higher BMI and a recent gain of weight, uh, you're at increased risk. The prevalence and the incidence uh, across the world varies definitely across the world, with an estimated one in 100,000 uh, among the general population. And this increased 20 folds if you're a woman between 20 and 40, uh, 44 years old, and an excess of 20% above your ideal body weight. And given the strong relationship between obesity and idiopathic intracranial hypertension, together with the increasing prevalence of obesity that we're seeing, it goes without saying that, and it's not surprising, that the worldwide instance of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is increasing. The primary problem of this disease is that there is increased intracranial pressure that results in papilledema, and then optic atrophy, and ultimately blindness. Up to a quarter of, our, of, of, this patient, of those cohorts of patients can uh, have blindness. And this is the main morbidity of this disease uh, to begin with. Almost all patients have either headaches or visual symptoms. Several investigations are done, fund, uh, fund, uh, retinoscopies, parametries, lumbar punctures, and neuroimaging in order to apply the DANDY criteria. The exact pathophysiology is not clear, but it is uh, postulated that it's a dysregulation of the CSF dynamics. One early causation theory, a physical one, and it, which states that increased intra-abdominal pressure increase the intrathoracic pressure and therefore increasing the venous pressure. Another theory is microthrombi happening in the, ve uh, micro in the venous sinuses. And you can easily link that to the hypercoagulable state that we see in obesity. One more theory is obstructive sleep apnea leading to nocturnal uh, hypercarbia, leading to vasodilation of the cerebral vessels. So the ultimate and primary goal of managing those patients is ultimately preservation of their visit, vision. And this can be done through several ways, medically using the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and loop diuretics, uh, as well as endomethazine with its vasoconstrictive effect on the cerebral blood vessels. Surgical options you're all aware of, the shunts, um, shunting procedures, and optic nerve fenestration and definitely weight loss with definitely exercise and dietary modification, as well as our very own bariatric surgery. The problem with surgical intervention is that the efficacy of shunting procedure is still controversial. So yes, most of the patients have improvement in their headache uh, symptoms, but the visual still contradicting. Some, some studies say they're improved, others report a progressive worsening of their vision. This is also coupled with the high complication rates of shunts with up to 86% fail and need some sort of a shunt revision. Then comes the optic nerve fenestration. It usually treats the visual problems but doesn't address the intracranial pressure, therefore leaving the patients with intractable headaches. When, we looked at weight, when I looked at weight loss, several studies uh, tested their outcome uh, this early systematic review from 2015 studied 17 papers of 67 patients uh, and reported a mean decrease of lumbar puncture opening pressure of 18.9 centimeter water, more than 90% improvement in their headaches, visual fields, and papilledema remission in 100% of the patients 
coupled with a BMI drop of 17 points. Another study, systematic review again, um, from 2017, compared surgical weight loss to non-surgical weight loss and included 65 patients and 277 patients in each arm. Bariatric surgery achieved 100% papilledema remission, headache remission in 90%, while the non-surgical group uh, had only 66% remission rate in their headache. 20% uh, uh, remission rate in their headaches, and only 66% have papilledema resolution. This was definitely, you can see the BMI drop is much better on the surgical side. Another study, a more later one in 2020, confirmed the same results uh, and focused more on the lumbar puncture dr uh, pressure drop, and you can see multiple point drop uh, with the surgical group. A more recent study fr from this year, um, this is the first of its kind, a randomized controlled trial comparing uh, bariatric surgery to non-bariatric weight loss. Again, uh, it was 66 patients equally divided and again, concluded the same results, intracranial pressure, uh, statistically higher improvement uh, in the bariatric surgery group. And the authors just concluded that bariatric surgery had a more favorable and sustained outcome with a superior quality of life at two years. I wanted to share our experience. This is my case series that was published earlier last year in SWORD where we had 16 patients that underwent laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy with a mean age of 31 years old and a BMI of, a mean BMI of 46. We had uh, a mean duration of symptom ranging from four to 11 years and a mean of five, uh, where patient, all of our patients had visual problems. 87% had uh, headaches. So we did the sleeve, we followed our patients at one year. As you can see, we had a good uh, uh, BMI drop from 46 down to 27. All of our patients had improvement in their headache symptoms with 100% remission in papilledema. I wanted to share a particular story of one of our patients, which uh, it's a really fascinating story with an unpredictable outcome. She came to us with completely loss of vision. So I would like to share her case. Um, this lady's story starts when she, she's a young lady, a 35-year-old, a mother of two, had a long history of disabling heading and blurring of vision. Neurology clinic referred her to uh, ophthalmology clinic. Uh, they did a retinoscopy, found moderate right optic atrophy and severe left optic uh, atrophy. This was again confirmed with perimetry, black boxes meaning bad. They concluded she had post-papilledemic bilateral optic atrophy. Then neurosurgery uh, clinic took over. They did um, urgent CT, uh, CT and MRI. They all came back normal. They did a serial lumbar puncture. And along her course, you can see it's not, getting, it's not improving. Uh, the first tap was 17, so that's OK. Later on, it got worse, up to 47 centimeter water. A little bit of improvement whenever they do the tap, but this is just temporary and short-lived. Uh, she also got pregnant. Uh, that made it a lot worse and raise it to a whopping 62 centimeter water. So they decided neurosurgery uh, to place a lumboperitoneal shunt. And again, it worked for her, it helped, but again, for a short period of time, and her symptoms just came back. At this point is when we started meeting this lady. She came to our, our clinic, and I wanted to just underline that, that she came to our clinic. She was never referred to us by any of the, all of the previous clinics that, that I mentioned. And this underlines uh, the lack of awareness, not by the general public, by, by medical professional. So, I mean, we should, I think it's our job to spread the awareness that bariatric surgery can help this lady or help this, our, our, our obesity population. So she's uh, 35 years old. She came to us BMI 46 uh, with severe central obesity. One, uh, a worsening headaches, only light perception, wandering gaze, total loss of visual acuity, and obviously a non-functioning shunt. Her story was, was, I mean, at the office, you know, we had to uh, hold her hands and walk her to, she couldn't see, she barely made out light, uh, day and night by light, and that's it. So it was, it was a touching, the whole team, you know, sympathized with this young, it's unfair, 35 years old, uh, it's unfair for her to be that blind. So from a technical consideration, bypass and the sleeve were, options were on the table. We counseled her and we decided on the sleeve. Pre-surgery mapping of the shunt is very important because you can, you can see uh, 
right there, the shunt is uh, in the way of your right worker hand port, so you have to be careful while placing uh, your ports. Shunts have a high risk of, of infections and increasing in the intracranial pressure. Uh, they do so during surgery. I mean, uh, this, can, this can happen by several ways, one of which is increasing resistance of shunt flow. You can have a retrograde insufflation by the carbon dioxide, can increase cava uh, pressure, hypercarbia, distal catheter occlusion, all of that can lead to worsening and increased intracranial pressure in those patients. So you have to be very careful when, when dealing with those patients. Uh, luckily, laparoscopy cause, um, results in minimal scarring, so you don't have to worry about that. Most shunts have valves, so the, again, retrograde insufflation is rare, but some of them uh, are valveless, so, so do consult and, and double check what type of valve she has, or you might risk a pneumoencephalus, last thing you need. Um, if the patient had a recent shunt, don't go too soon after the shunt, because one report um, uh, after a lap coli in a patient who had a recent shunt reported massive surgical emphysema. Why? Because the track around the shunt wasn't uh, still patent, and it allowed the air to go in under the skin. Use a non-touch non technique as much as possible. Some authors uh, reported clamping the shunt in long procedures, but usually I don't think that's the case in our uh, bariatric surgeries. Also, others reported catheter externalization. Again, our surgeries are clean, but do consider those two options. Definitely lo use low insufflation pressure if it's the procedure is getting lengthy for any reason. Do periodic desufflation and then reinsufflation. Definitely monitor the patient transcranial Doppler, ICPs, and do whatever uh, uh, CSF drainage you can do if absolutely uh, necessary or deemed. Ensure at the end that the shunt is permeable either by um, flushing the reservoir or gentle aspiration of the tip. Also, anesthesia can play a role by minimizing the intracranial pressure by head elevation, lowering the mean tidal carbon dioxide, avoiding hypoxia, and using IV mannitol whenever necessary. So we took the patient to OR. As you can see, at the time of surgery, severe center obesity diagnosed in, ma in a huge fatty liver. Together with, as you can see, the shunt hiding uh, in a sea of fat, obviously non-functioning. So surgery went well, uneventful, and then the patient came back on follow-up at five months with a surprising and unpredictable outcome. Uh, she just Gained, regained her, uh, her vision. She lost 45 kilograms, and all of a sudden she regained the vision. This was deemed impossible by ophthalmology, neurology, and everyone because she, le she had atrophy. And this is surprising to everyone, but you know, at the end of the day, every, the whole team and everyone were, was really happy for her. This was confirmed by perimetry. You can see the black boxes uh, no, you know, decrease on either side. Sorry, skip the slide. Luckily, she came back to us. She had goldstone, so we had a chance, a golden chance to go in and see. Remember, uh, her tube was buried in a sea of fat. Now you can see it laying down with minimal obesity inside the abdomen. And if you look down at the pelvis, you can see free flow of the CSF. So obviously, this was what happened. Uh, the, the, the shunts come back to work and relieve the pressure in the brain. We took a quick peek at the sleeve, and then we went ahead and uh, finished our gold platter. Three years out, she's down to a healthy BMI with, with uh, just tubular vision, but a good perception and good perception of light, but she can now walk totally unassisted as she can see. Uh, currently, she's five years out, gained, regained a little bit of weight with a BMI of 28, just have a little bit of reflux right now. In conclusion, idiopathic intracranial hypertension has a strong and solid association with obesity. It's still not widely recognized as an indication for bariatric surgery, and I think it's our role to spread the awareness. The problem is bariatric surgery takes time to take, to take its effect and show its effect, and those patients are not getting any better. If anything, they're really getting uh, progressively bad. So we need to intervene the sooner, the better. Finally, bariatric surgery is considered safe and, infect, and, and effective, uh, an effective uh, treatment modality for patients with intracranial hypertension. We just need more RCTs, possibly comparing different types of bariatric surgery. Thank you for your time.
I don't have any questions. Um, this is something that I do see in my practice, not so commonly, but actually Dr. Moore was saying that she has an ophthalmologist who routinely refers to her. It's one of my referral lines at home. Um, it's you know, super, super exciting. Usually not as exciting as your story. Usually we have threatened vision loss and we can intervene, and, um, but to, to have a return of it, yeah, how rewarding, what a great story. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. wonderful. Thank you. Oh, yes, Sylvia. Can we have the mic hot where Dr. Beener is standing, please? Thank you. Thank you for that this speech because especially these patients are very close to my heart because they have a very severe disease. I just want to make a comment because sometimes people have a ventri ventricular um, peritoneal shunt and they can also convert it to a ventricular arterial shunt. Mm. So sometimes it's also an option to make it a little bit safer for the patient. Of course, in your patient, yes. not possible. Just if you see patients like that, you can communicate even with the a neurologist or to, to change that so a bit more safer also just in case of leakage and because leakage will be catastrophic for the shunt peritoneal. Absolutely. But yeah, thank makes, you. Makes very, very point. important talk. I've thanks. seen some ventricular plural shunts too, so it is, it's uh, <laughs> definitely other options. Go ahead. We have Dr. Miller. I, oh, I was going to do that at the end. Dr. Miller joining us again this time to discuss a stable